Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, I, my background is that I'm a psychotherapist. Okay, so I want to start off with, with a, a basic principle of psychology, okay? And I want you guys to try and remember this. So the first thing is that our thoughts and our beliefs lead to our, what we feel, okay? So our thoughts and our beliefs lead to what we feel. And then what we feel leads to our actions or our behaviours, okay? So can anyone remember that? Can you repeat it back to me? What was it? What was the first thing? Our thoughts and beliefs. Yes, yeah, so what we think and what we believe affect how we feel. And then those feelings go into actions and our behaviours, what we do. Okay? So I want you to try to remember that. I'm going to use that as the principle of the talk that I'm going to give today. So I was, I was asked to um, talk about in-laws. Okay? And so when I first got this, I thought, oh my gosh, this subject always comes up and it brings up so many different feelings. Now even just now I want to ask you guys, and I want this to be not a, a lecture or me talking to you, I want you to interact and feedback to me and share your thoughts as well. Okay, so just feel free, put your hands up, you can ask questions, I'm absolutely happy for you to do that. Okay, so when I say in-laws, what comes up for you? What's the first thought that comes up in your mind? And be really honest with me. Can anybody share? Mother-in-law, okay. So what comes up after mother-in-law? Not mother-in-law, everybody from the, that family. If the husband is bad, they all are bad. Okay, so your thoughts are if the husband is bad, then everybody's bad. Experience. Okay. Experience. Okay. So we've got a lady here who said, if, you know, Auntie said if the husband is bad, then everybody is bad. What else? What else is coming up for you as soon as we say in-laws? Would they like me? Would they like me? Okay. So you want to feel accepted by your in-laws, okay? What else? Do I have to work for the in-laws? Okay. Who else has that feeling? That do I have to do work for them? Yeah. What about the younger ladies in the audience? What what comes up for you guys? Say that to me again. Okay. So you're going to have a family that's going to love me. And they're gonna, and I'm gonna look look them back. Okay. What else? Fake family. Fake family. It's not truly your family. Okay. So that's um, yeah. Okay. So it's is it gonna be a fake family and that they're not gonna truly be my family? So those are the thoughts. How how are you feeling when you have these thoughts? Like for example, yourself. And if you don't want to answer, it's fine. So when you think of it being fake family, how do you start feeling? What happens in in your in, in your body, in in your feelings? Okay. And be careful of how you act. Okay. Okay. And what's really interesting is if you look at the old, younger responses and to the older responses, you see there's already a kind of a difference in how we're looking at things. And so I want to go back to remember thoughts and beliefs lead to our feelings, which lead to behaviours. Okay. Now I'm not going to lecture you. I just want to give you. I'm just going to share three stories, okay? And I want you to kind of, each time I share the story, I want you to imagine that you're the character. Could you do that for me? Okay, so we're going to just do some imagination, some visualization, and really getting into how you feel being this character, okay? The first character is a 19-year-old girl, okay? Or maybe 20, 21-year-old girl. Her name's Amina, okay? And it's seven o'clock in the morning, and the alarm has just gone. And it's beep, 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 beep. And Amina's just turned around and this alarm's gone off. She puts her hand out from underneath her duvet and she switches it off. She turns back around and it's, it's a Saturday and she thinks, I don't have to get up at seven o'clock. I'm gonna go back to sleep. She rolls over, she falls back to sleep and she's under her duvet, it's warm. There's no noise, there's no worries in her mind. And she wakes up again. And when she wakes up, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. So she, she turns around, she looks at her clock, and it's, oh my gosh, it's 10 o'clock. I need to get up. So she gets up, and she's in her pyjamas, and she puts on her, maybe her gown, and she goes downstairs. She put, ties her hair up and just goes downstairs. When she goes downstairs, as she's going down the stairs, she can smell some amazing cooking. 
okay? And it's coming from the kitchen, she's like, oh my gosh, I know that smell. So she runs into the kitchen and her mom is cooking. She hugs her mom from the back and she says, Mama, what are you cooking? And her mama says, your favorite, and it's lamb. Like, I've got an eight-year-old daughter and she loves lamb, so I'm going to use lamb. And she's like, oh, wow, this, is, this, this looks amazing. And she kind of wants to put her fingers into the pan to taste it. And the mom's like, no, take it from the spoon, have a taste. And so she tastes it and she gives, gives her mom a little hug. And then she decides, okay, where's, she, she's looking at and she tries to look for her father. She goes through her house and she t puts her head just round the door and she sees her dad reading the paper. And she says, Papa, are you okay? And he says, yes, Foot, I'm okay. Foot in Bangla is like daughter or a loving name. She says, yes, Foot, I'm okay. Um, are you up now? Have you had some breakfast? And she says, not yet. I'm just going to go and have some. So she goes back in the kitchen and she gets herself a bowl out and she loves Cocoa Pops. So she's going to have for herself some Cocoa Pops. She's going to sit at the table, her legs up onto the chairs, her mum's cooking and she just has these Cocoa Pops. And she's messing on her phone, as like 19, 20 year olds do these days, millennials, we're always on our phones. So she's looking at her phone and she gets a message. So she says to her mum, jumps up, really excited, Mama, my best friend Sophia has just passed her driving test, we're going to go out to celebrate. So she, her mum says, okay, what time are you going? She says, we're going to go around lunchtime and we'll be out for a, a few hours. So she goes upstairs, she spends the next two hours getting ready, really excited to meet her friends, they're going to go and celebrate and so it gets to 12 o'clock and she's just about to leave the house and she says to her mum and dad, Amma, Abba, I'm going to go. Okay, so they say, okay, be safe, make sure you're back for 5 o'clock. And so she says, no problem, I'll be back for 5. She goes out to her friends, they have a really great time um, and then she comes home in the evening and her parents say that it's, it's Saturday evening so we're going to eat together. They sit down and her mom and her dad ask her about her job and what she's doing and how it's going. And they talk all evening, they just talk. And then at 8 o'clock she decides, you know what, I'm going to get an early night. I'm going to read a book and I'm going to go to bed. Okay? And she gets into bed. Now that, if you guys just realise just for a second, imagine that's you in your homes being 21 with your parents. Okay? Now I want, I'm a photographer, so I'm going to change the lens, okay? So we're going to look through a different lens now. I want you to imagine that Amina is going to get married, and it's 7 o'clock in the morning again, okay? And the alarm has gone off, okay? And she decides that, oh my gosh, I'm so tired, but I want to go back to sleep. But in her heart, she's feeling like, but can I? Because I know that I'm expected to get up and make breakfast. I'm expected to get up and do the chores. And by 10 o'clock, I'm expected to have everything done. So she can't do that. So she decides, OK, I'm going to get up, and she gets up. When she goes downstairs, the in-laws are there, and her in-laws are saying say to her, oh, no, could you make me a cup of tea? Could you make me some toast? And so the first service she has to do is for her in-laws. Okay. Then it gets to lunchtime, and instead of it being the other way around where her mum's cooking, she is expected to cook. Okay. She cooks for the whole family, she gets the food ready, and then after that, she, she, she maybe she has a job, or, or maybe she has other tasks to do. So say she has a part-time job. She goes out to do her job, she comes home in the evening, and then she... A friend calls and she says to her mother-in-law, Amma, can I go out because my friend has called? And she said, no, not today. You can't go today because we have guests coming round. So she can't go. So I want, you, I want you to just to think about, what I'm trying to get you to think about is this. When we look at it from a certain perspective, we have a certain view. But then when we look at things from a different perspective, we have a different view. And I can talk all day long about so many daughter-in-laws being abused and mistreated, and I can say the same thing about mother-in-laws, okay? This is not a battle. And I want to take you to another word, okay? So we talked about in-laws. I want to give you another word, and I want you to tell me what comes up for you. Family. If I say family, what happens? What are you thinking? What are your first thoughts? Strong bond. Strong bond. What else? You think of mum, okay? What else? What else do you think when you think of family? People that you can rely on. 
people you can rely on. What else? Anyone else? Somebody you want to do things for. Now, somewhere along, sorry, go ahead. A group of people living together. A group of people living together. Do they live together kindly? Mm -hmm. It depends on the nature of the family. Okay, so it depends on the nature of the family, but a group of people who live together. Now, somewhere along the way, we went from in laws and we have family, but we don't connect them. Somewhere along the way, we have these ideas and these beliefs, and I'm going to take you back to thoughts and beliefs lead to feelings, lead to behaviour. And what we tend to do is we look at the behaviour at the end. So we find daughter-in-laws perhaps saying, oh, my mother-in-law hasn't done this, my husband hasn't done that. We look at the behaviour. But what we don't look at, and what I've been privileged for the last 10 years to be able to do is, as part of my psychology, the most interesting and the most rewarding part is that I get to sit with people every day and they tell me their stories. Okay, that's the most interesting part. They tell me what they thought when they were children. They tell me what their relationship was like with their fathers and their mothers. What their relationship is like now as they're married. What they went through and through their college years. I get to be a part of somebody's life during those sessions. And what we don't do as families is we, we, we go into marriage and we automatically say the in-laws. And the, 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 on the one side we've got a daughter-in-law and there's the anxieties around what she's going to be like, what she's going to do. And then the younger generation having all these fears around how it's going to be. But nobody ever thinks that we're going to be one family. Nobody ever thinks that. So I want to change the lens and I want you guys to try and think about it in this way. If we change those thoughts. now. We had the amazing top speakers this morning and all of the time it was the perspective of Islam that if we come from Islam, if we come from Islam, if we come from Islam, then everything will be okay. And that is the ideal. But unfortunately that's not the reality. That isn't what's happening. And so we have people from, so we have, for example, we start with the unit, say the, the son with his family, okay? Even at that stage, they're not, communi they're not communicating. Their thoughts and their ideas of getting married are usually different. And they don't have take the time to talk, to really say, like, what do we want our families to be like? Like, I do business coaching, okay? And the first things I do is I get people to look at their, um, their goals, okay? So we do the plan ahead and we look at what is their ideal, what is their mission statement? And I, when I speak to my clients, I get them to ask this question. I say, you know when we're looking at it individually, like this is my mother-in-law, this is my son-in-law, this is my daughter-in-law. How about we had a family mission statement? How about we looked at it before we got into it and really looked at it from different lenses? I want to go, and I'm going to take you into another story now, okay? And I want you to really get into the story and believe that you're this person, okay? And it's a mother. And she has a son, okay? And her son is 25 years old, and he is the apple of her eyes. Like, she adores him, you know. She probably couldn't have children for a long time, and then when he was born, he was her world, okay. And I don't know for which backgrounds everybody's from here, but I'm from a Bangladeshi background, and the boys are, like, adored by the moms, okay. They don't let them cook, they don't let them clean, they're just, you know, my son. And they, they love their children, okay, as do all parents. So you've got a mum who's brought up her son for 25 years. She's educated him, she's looked after him. And as she's getting older, she's in the kitchen. So I want you to imagine her in the kitchen. And her hands are hurting, okay? And she's washing up and her hands are hurting. And she kind of does this, you know, like kind of when our mums are older, and my mum's a bit older, and she kind of moves her wrists around because they hurt. And so her son walks in and he says, Emma, are you, are you okay? And she says, yes, I'm fine, I'm absolutely fine. And so he, she looks up at him, and she looks at him with, with love, and she says, I can't wait for you to get married next year. I can't wait. And we're going to bring a daughter-in-law into the house. And she's going to be a part of my family, she's going to help me. And she's going to support, and she's going to be an extension. And when you have children, they will be a legacy for me. They will be a legacy, they will be a part of, part of who I am. Okay? This is the perspective of the mother-in-law. Okay, so she is looking at it from that angle. 
So when, when the daughter-in-law is coming in, she's not seeing that. And the mother-in-law is not seeing that this, this girl was in her mum's house. Overnight, she's not expected to come into this home and just change. And so I'm going to take you back to thoughts and beliefs equal feelings, equal actions, okay, and behaviours. Because ultimately what we want is a family that get on, okay? A family that support one another, fulfil each other's rights and obligations from an Islamic perspective. But you also have to understand that not everybody is at that same level of Islamic understanding. And if we are blessed that we are here, you know, this, these posters were sent out all over the internet. And anybody that saw it could have taken the opportunity to be here today. But somehow Allah SWT chose us to be in this room together. And for that, you know, it's thanks. You know, and it's, it's Alhamdulillah to Allah because He's allowing us to learn something and blessed us to be a part of this gathering. So even if nobody else is here, we are here. And today, if there's one thing, you know, I, as I was on the train, I was coming here, I always think this before I do a talk, and I say, if there's just one person in this room, that takes away something and there is a change in their thoughts and their perspectives. Because maybe somebody else doesn't have that understanding. But if in today's talk our awareness is raised, and we do, then we can make that change. We can go back into our families and do something different. We can decide instead of looking at it as mother-in-law, father-in-law, daughter-in-law, it's family. And how do we create that culture? So this is where I want to take you guys now. How do we create it from the beginning? Okay? I want to talk to you about these thoughts that we have. Okay. Our thoughts are created from, from the moment that we're born. Okay? So if you look at everything that we have today, how did we become this person? Where do thoughts come from? Where do our belief systems come from? Experiences. Experiences. Where else? Parents. Parents. Where else? Usually mothers. Usually our mothers. Our mothers. Our mothers are our first teachers, of course. Our mothers. Where else did our belief systems come from? Observation. Observation from workplaces, from the media, you know, from our communities, from generations and generations of something being done and never questioned. From television. From television. And so what we have to do is we have to raise that awareness for ourselves. Ultimately, on the day of judgment, we will stand in front of Allah for our actions. We can say all day long, our mother-in-law wasn't like this, we didn't have the perfect daughter-in-law, and vice versa. But ultimately, we are going to stand in front of Allah. And my advice to you is this. Every interaction that we have is not between you and I. This conversation that we're having is not between you and I. It's between myself and Allah. Every interaction that you have with your daughter-in-laws, or with your son-in-laws, or your mother-in-laws, is not between you and, you and them. You have to remember that it's always between you and Allah. Because if we make that intention that I am doing everything possible and it's for the sake of Allah, then it takes away the pressure. But I, I know that the generations are there and the, limit, and the belief systems are there and they're deeply rooted. But we have a room full of people and change starts with ourselves. Allah SWT tells us that if we don't change ourselves then the condition won't change. We have to change something within us. And maybe the world won't change out there. But you can change your worlds. If you just work on your family unit, and the next generation, and you make that change, and you decide today, that you know what, instead of looking at it as daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, I'm gonna look at it as family. And I'm gonna to talk to my children, and we're gonna to decide together what kind of family we want. And we're gonna sometimes change the lens, because it's very easy to say, I'm wronged. I'm wronged, I'm the mother, I should have had this. I'm the wife, I should have had this. But ultimately, if we don't have that empathy, if we don't have that ability to look outside of ourselves, we will continue to carry on having the same thoughts and the same beliefs, and then that will lead to the same feelings, and that will lead to the same actions and behaviours, which is broken families. I was also asked to talk about um, domestic abuse, and I would like to touch on that. Um, I myself was in a 10-year abusive relationship. Um, I got married in my early 20s, probably when I just turned 20, and um, it started very, very quickly. It started with verbal abuse and then physical abuse, and I stayed and stayed and stayed for 10 years. Now, the things I want to highlight for me that's most important is about when we, before the marriage, okay, what are we looking for and how do we attract these kind of things, okay? During it, I would be like, you know, it's all his fault. He beat me, he abused me, he didn't let me do this, he didn't let me do that, he called me names. 
But I started to grow and I got wiser. And what I realised is that I attracted, part of me attracted that. And that's because of where I was as a, as a young girl. And this is something I want to advise you guys. If you have daughters or sons at home, and for the daughters and the sons, build good relationships with your parents. Because when you have good relationships at home, and you feel a sense of belonging, and there's communication, you are less likely to want to go out of the frying pan into a fire into a fire. You're less likely to want to have that belonging somewhere outside of your home. You're more likely to be able to say to your parents, you know what, I go out to college, I got you. I'm not naive, you know, I grew up in this country, you will go out into the world. If you see someone and you like them, before you fall into sin, you can go to your parents and you can say, look, I've, I've met somebody and they do it the right way. But if you don't build that at home, and I advise you over, and Nurman Ali Khan has a great talk on this. At the end, I'll try and find it for you and give you the actual talk. But he talks about this in depth, that if you don't build that relationship, that confidence in your daughters, it's easy for a daughter to go out and a guy to compliment her. And she's like, wow, I've never felt like this before. But at home, her fathers, her brothers, her mothers, they're not making her feel like that. She's feeling empty. She's feeling like she can't speak to you, so she's finding a home elsewhere. And it happens so quickly, and before you know it, the, the, the girls and the boys, they're not even aware that that's happening. And so they go into relationships that are also mimicking what they felt at home. They're looking for somewhere to belong. And another thing I want to talk about is your own relationships. Because if your model at home is abuse, and you're, you've been yelling and shouting in front of your children and that's all they've learned. When they meet somebody, when they meet somebody, what's going to be in their radar? Think about the thoughts and the beliefs. Everything that their world has been created out of is from what has been happening at home. So they're not going to recognise that something's wrong. They're not going to see a person who hasn't got good manners because we've been yelling at each other at home. We've been tearing each other apart for the last 20 years of these children's lives. So they go out, they meet a person who's bad mannered, and they're not gonna, it's not gonna come up for them. Because we are subconscious people, you know, subconsciously, on the conscious level we don't recognise it. You'll see a person very confident, very you know, brave and strong, but internally they're broken. So we have to know that a part of when children go into domestic abuse relationships, it's part of it is what happened at home. How were we as mothers, were we submissive, were we argumentative? What was happening for us? Because whether we like it or not, we need to be aware that that's going to impact our sons and our daughter. And I'm not saying that men are just the abusers. I've dealt with so many cases where women have thrown frying pans at men. It isn't just one way, and I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that part of it comes back to how we build our relationships with our children. And even if this, this room of people could today go away with the intention that today, I'm going to really take interest in my child's life. And as children, I'm going to try and open up to my parents. Maybe they didn't get it all right, you know? We're not going to get it right. I've got two children now, and I, I have such an appreciation for my mother. She had like 10 of us. And so, and I know what hard time I gave her as a child, you know, as a teenager. But we're not, they're not always going to get it right. But if you just make that effort to feel a sense of belonging at home, to feel like, you know, you've got that security, what that does is that then opens up that doorway so when you're ready to get married, you can have those conversations. You will pick healthy people because we mimic behaviour and we go into environments that were similar to ours. And when I was growing up, there was just violence all the time. So when I got married, to me, it was just the same thing. He's still looking after, after me. He's still providing. It took me 10 years to understand that it's wrong. I couldn't even, I couldn't even stand up and talk back because my mum always said, you stay silent. That was the message. You stay silent. So you have to really recognise what belief systems you are injecting into your own children and what belief systems you have for yourself. The second thing I want to talk about in terms of domestic abuse is say a daughter or two children get into a situation where there's DV, I recommend highly, highly that people get involved. One of the things I found was, and, I, and I, as I've been talking to predominantly with women who have gone through domestic abuse, is that there was no support system there. That there is such a stigma in the community, even for the woman to speak out and say that she was abused. Because the first thing that comes along is, what did she do wrong? 
What did she do wrong? And we really have to change this paradigm because it isn't about somebody doing something wrong or not. We are responsible for ourselves. If, I, if you yell at me and you shout at me, even if you're in my face, I have a choice whether I hit you or not. If it gets to that, I walk away and I seek advice. Don't suffer in silence. If you, if you are struggling, if you have any signs of being abused, then you tell somebody. And for the elders, you know, I think it's important that you listen. And you know, this, this idea of, you know, stay, make it work. Unless the person is willing to seek help, then it's not going to work. And that's the honest truth. We, when we do marriage counselling, if, the, if, if there's domestic abuse, we can't even do work with the couple because it's a different level. We can only work with couples that have just normal issues, communication issues, um, problems talking to each other or other issues, but when it's domestic violence, you can't. Because it's, it's, that person has to, has to be responsible. And I would say don't leave your daughters there to suffer because what can happen? The doctor once said to me, what will happen, Nazma? Is he will push you one day, just, just a small push, You'll fall back, you'll hit your head on the table, and then that will be it. And that was a big wake-up call for me. And for 10 years, I didn't tell anybody because I was ashamed how my mum would face the world. I was ashamed, how would I ever get married again? I was ashamed who would look after my children. I was ashamed of all those things. But sh we have to stop victim shaming. We have to stop this. And when I finally came out to talk about it, I was ostracized by the community. You know, or you know, she must have done something. She, she looked really happy on the outside. I was qualified. I was working. On the outside, you wouldn't think there was anything wrong. But on the inside, in people's homes, and I'm going to leave you with this, these beautiful words that I always reflect back on, which is the best of you are, are those who are best to their family, and I am the best to my family. Because it, it's easy to be kind to the person on the street and just say, hey, how are you? And I'm great. And smile at them. It's easy because they don't challenge us. But in our homes, in our homes it's a different story because we close that door and we're with the people that rely on us most. And we can be the most vulnerable. And if we're not safe in our homes, then where else do we turn to? So I'm going to go back to the beginning. Our beliefs and our thoughts lead to our feelings which lead to behaviours. I want you to go away today and really reflect on what are your beliefs? What are your thoughts in terms of getting a daughter-in-law? Or if you're a daughter-in-law, how are you thinking about your husband, about your mother-in-law, about the family? And if you have these objections or these um, defence mechanisms, if this language is like, you know, they're going to be mean to me or they're horrible, have a think, why? Why is that coming up for me? Why are these beliefs here? Is it something that's real? Or have I picked it up from my mom because she was abused? Have I picked it up from when I was a daughter-in-law and they did this to me so I'm not going to let her get away with anything? But remember, in the end we're family. And we don't get to choose our family. You know, Allah SWT bestows our family upon us. And we've got one family and they're just a test to us. We Sometimes we think we own them. You know, like we own our husbands and we own our mothers and we own our children. We don't own anything. They were gifts to us. And they're the biggest gifts. And if we don't look after that, and if we don't nurture that, then how will we answer to Allah one day? So that's what I'm going to leave you guys with. Thank you for your for your time and being here. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Sister Nazma.